Good morning. My name is Pastor Olson. I'm just a little younger version of a Pastor Olson that you've been used to for the last few months. I'm actually a pastor at uh, St. Paul's in on Alaska. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today as, as my father is, is down south uh, visiting some friends. Today we are going to be looking at a number of passages that focus on Judgment Day. We are in the season of end times, which has started last week with Reformation. Today is technically called Last Judgment Sunday. So you're going to notice that a number of the Bible verses we look at are actually somewhat frightening. And granted, those Judgment Day will be a frightening day for those who do not believe. But for you and I who have faith in Christ, when that day comes, when Jesus returns, it'll be a day that we are looking forward to. We can finally go home to our home in heaven. And so in our sermon today, we're going to be looking specifically at how Christ is our King and how He moves things around in this world for the good of our souls and the souls of people around the world. Let's begin with, with our opening hymn, Hymn 254, The Day Full of Grace. May God wish you bless your worship today. Please stand. We worship in the name of the God, the Father, who orders legions of angels to protect us from evil, and the name of God the Son, whose victory over Satan on the cross of Calvary won our peace, and the name of God the Holy Spirit, who equips us with faith to fight our spiritual battles against Satan and to win with Christ. Let us confess our sins together. King of kings and Lord of lords, I humbly plead before your throne. 
I have rebelled against your authority and deserve to be crushed beneath your feet. Satan has enslaved me and made me his comrade in his army of evil. But you came to destroy the devil's power and to set his captives free. Have mercy on me and forgive me. Christ has overcome all your enemies. When you were held prisoner by the devil, God set you free in Christ. He has forgiven all your sins, having canceled the written code of the law that stood against you. He tore the list of your sins from Satan's grasp. He disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by his cross and empty tomb. Your Savior and King, Jesus Christ, has given you the victory. Your sins are all forgiven. Amen. Let's sing together a hymn of praise. We'll sing hymn 278, verses 1 and 2. Or 1 and 4, excuse me. pray. Lord of all nations, we praise you for the blessings you have showered on our country. Guide and guard our elected officials as they care for the needs of all citizens. Give them wisdom to rule our society with honesty and justice, that we may have peace in our lives and opportunities to witness to your love, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament lesson for today comes from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. You get a picture of Judgment Day. I continued to watch until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was flames of fire, its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire flowed out from his presence, thousands upon thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated, and books were opened. I kept paying attention to the sound of the boastful words that the horn was speaking. I kept watching until the beast was killed, and its body was destroyed and thrown into the burning fire. This is God's word. We'll continue with our psalm of the day, Psalm 91. You'll see the note there in your bulletin that this is a psalm usually referred to as a soldier's psalm. As Veteran Day comes near, we're thinking about this, that many members of the military, as it says there, have carried the psalm into the battle as they think about God being their refuge and their safety. We'll sing the refrain to this psalm together, and you'll notice that the verses to the psalm are responsive, so we'll speak those. shadow of your wings. 
dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. If you make the Most High your dwelling, then no harm will befall you, no disaster will come near your tent. For He will command His angels concerning you, to guard you with all their ways. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the soul. Glory be, be to the Father, and, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Keep me, keep me, as the apple of your eye. Hide me, hide me, in the shadow of your wings. Our next lesson comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, again focusing our thoughts on the urgency, the fact that Judgment Day could come at any moment leaves us with the urgency of running to God's word and focusing on his promises there. Concerning the times and dates, brothers, there is no need to write to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, when people are saying peace and security, destruction, will, certainly come, will suddenly come on them like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will certainly not escape. But you brothers are not in the dark so that this day takes you by surprise like a thief. For you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then let us not sleep like everyone else. But rather let us remain alert and sober. To be sure, those who sleep sleep at night. And those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. You see, God did, not dis God did not appoint us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as you are also doing. This is God's Word. Please stand for a Gospel lesson. The gospel for today comes from Matthew chapter 25. Again, a picture of what we will see on the day when Christ returns. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in His presence and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was lacking clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or lacking clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will answer them, Amen, I tell you, just as you did it for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire which is prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you did not give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you did not give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, lacking clothes, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not take care of me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you, hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or lacking clothes, or sick or in prison, and did not serve you? At that time he will answer them, Amen, I tell you, just as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. And they will go away to eternal punishment by the righteous to eternal life. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let's confess our common faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn, Great God, What Do I See and Hear? Please stand. The sermon lesson for today comes from Matthew chapter 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him, and mocked him, saying, 
Hail, King of the Jews. They spit on him, took the staff, and hit him repeatedly on his head. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. This is God's word. Please be seated. What we have in front of us today is one of the saddest, most heartbreaking verses in all of Scripture, in my opinion. Our Lord and our Savior is being beaten, mocked, spit at by these soldiers. And when you read this, you want to jump into the scene and shout out to them, don't you know who this guy is? He's your Savior. He's your King. What are you doing to him? Don't you see it? But they didn't see it. They didn't see him as he really is. Pontius Pilate didn't see it. The Jews didn't see it. Even his disciples struggled to see who Christ really was throughout his time with them. Today we're going to think about how not only do these soldiers and so many others misunderstand how Christ truly is a king, but even we misunderstand Christ as a king too. See, as we think about Christ ruling and Christ as a king, there's three different areas over which we know Jesus rules. We call them three different things, and we talk about this in catechism class. You might have to remember back in these days, we talk about the kingdom of power, the kingdom of grace, and the kingdom of glory. The kingdom of power is him ruling over this world, in control of everything that happens in our world. The kingdom of grace has to do with him ruling in our hearts, and the kingdom of glory has to do with him ruling in heaven over the saints who have gone before us. Now the kingdom of power, Christ ruling in our world, Jesus, just before he ascended into heaven, said these words. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He is in control of our world. Everything that happens in this world is because our Savior, our King Jesus, allowed it or caused it to happen. Kingdoms being built up or being torn down. Diseases happening in this place or that place. Problems in your own personal life. Problems around the world. Good things, bad things. Nothing happens without our King, Jesus, in control of all of it. And that that poses this dilemma for you and me, right? If Christ is King, if Christ really is in charge of everything that happens in this world, then why is there suffering? Why am I struggling? Why are there problems in this world? And there it begins, a misunderstanding of what it means that Christ is king. See, his job as king is not to make sure that your life is absolutely perfect and without sin, to cure your financial troubles, your emotional struggles, or your physical struggles. Or Christ's job as king is not to eradicate poverty or racism or disease from this world. And yet, when we think about Christ being king and and think about him being in control of this world, we want to pull Jesus aside and give him a little bit of advice. Say, Lord, if I were king, this is what I'd be doing. Why don't you think about doing these things instead? Or think about his kingdom of grace, how he rules in our hearts. This comes from John chapter 14. It says this, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will hold on to my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He's talking about in our hearts. Or in 1 Corinthians 6, you may know these words. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have from God? Our Savior, our King, rules in our hearts. He rules right here. And we struggle with that thought, too. Because if he rules in my heart, then why do I struggle so much with temptation? Why do I feel like God isn't right next to me if he's right here in my heart? We have people who, when they look at Christians and their moral failures, so often say, I thought you were a Christian. 
And should people expect a different moral standard? Should they have a higher moral standard for Christians? Absolutely, but we fail all the time. They look at you and me as individual Christians. They look at you and me as, a, or as, a, as an organization, Christian organization, as a church. Christian school, Christian grade school, high school, college. And they say, I thought you were Christians. And it leaves us ashamed on the one hand, but we also want to look at our Savior who lives in us and say to him, Lord, if you're ruling in our hearts, I, I think you should do it another way. We want to pull Jesus aside, our king aside, and give him more advice on how he should rule, not just in our world, but even in our hearts. You see, our king, our savior, is exactly the kind of king that we need, even though he's not the kind of king that we expect. See, the soldiers didn't see it. The soldiers didn't understand the kind of king that this world needed. They mocked him, they beat him, they spit at him, because they didn't get it. A typical king will have an army, but this king, our king, he went and fought by himself, because he knew that we could not do the fighting. He sacrificed himself for us. Our king worked to expand his kingdom in our hearts, not so that he could become rich or famous or powerful, like typical kings. Now, our king worked to make you and me rich. It doesn't seem like a very heroic march into battle, does it, by our Savior? And as these, these soldiers, they beat him and they mocked him and they spit at him, our Savior allowed that to happen for one very simple reason, because those soldiers were the object of his love. And so are you. In some commentaries I read, they look at what a cohort was, which is mentioned here in Matthew 27, about how many soldiers there possibly were at this time mocking and spitting at and beating Jesus. And one source said there was maybe around 600 soldiers. I don't know if that's true or not. But we see later on, some of these soldiers at least, several verses later in the same chapter, after Jesus had died on the cross, it says this, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Imagine beating on someone, mocking this person, spitting at him, and finding out that he actually is not just a king, but the Son of God. There's something humble about that and what they went through. But there must have been something joyous about that too as they recognized that this king was no ordinary king. This king was their king who was fighting for them, fighting for you. And so let's think again about who our Savior is as king and how he rules both in our world and in our hearts and finally in heaven. How does Christ rule in our world? What is his purpose? Why does he do the things that he does? Why does he allow the things that he does? Look at this verse. This comes from Acts chapter 17. It says, From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and, from, and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. He tells us what his purpose is in reigning in this world, in the kingdom of power. He moves things around, big, builds kingdoms up, tears other kingdoms down, allows problems in our lives or other lives all for one very simple purpose, for the salvation of more souls, to get more people in contact with the gospel so that more people can be saved. We struggle to understand how that all works when it comes to war, when it comes to an election, when it comes to a pandemic, how is this going to save more souls? I have no idea. But ask yourself this question, as it talks here about he decides who is born, when, and where in different parts of the world, in different places in time. Who was it who shared the gospel with you? Who shared their faith with you? So you could be here today with faith. 
It may very well have been more than one or two people. That is not a coincidence that you happen to run into those people throughout your life, that you'd be here today with faith. That was all part of God's plan. As he moved things around in history for hundreds, thousands of years, just for you. So that you could be in his kingdom of grace where he rules in your heart. Now think about that. What does that mean that he rules not only in our world but also in our heart? Because we struggle with that, right? If he rules here, then why do I struggle with temptation still? And is there a fact that we do get better at saying no to temptation throughout our life? Absolutely. It's something we work at. But on this side of the grave, we will never be completely perfect. We'll continue to sin. And what does it mean that Christ lives right here? It means that when you sin, even before you sin, you know that you are forgiven child of God because Christ lives here in your heart. That we don't need to feel if God is with us. We look at his promises and he says that he's right here. That he couldn't be any closer to you. That's what it means that Christ rules in your heart. Christ rules in our world, in the kingdom of power, so that he can rule in your heart, in the kingdom of grace, so that eventually he can rule as well over us in his kingdom of glory, over you and me in heaven. Look what it says in uh, Revelation chapter 11. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. When that day comes, when we are in heaven, we're not going to struggle to understand how Christ is our king and how he rules. We're not going to have to believe with eyes of faith. We're going to believe with our own eyes as we see God, as we see our king in front of us, as we see all the saints and angels in heaven and him ruling over you and me. We look forward to that day. For now, as we live in this world where Christ continues as king, and moves things around throughout history and throughout our own world today for the salvation of more souls, we get to have a front row seat to all that he does. We can see little glimpses of why God does what he does, maybe in just in part. You can think back in time to the Roman Empire, why he allowed the Roman Empire to be what it was at that time. Because after Christ ascended into heaven, those disciples went out. There were good roads for travel so missionaries could go out and spread the gospel. With good roads at a peaceful time. There was one common language throughout the world. Or fast forward in the history during the time of the Reformation, which we celebrated last week. Think about all the things that God allowed politically during that time frame so that Martin Luther could continue to preach and to write and to translate the Bible. The Pope was preoccupied with his war with the Turks and and with the Muslims. And he wanted the Germans on his side for for soldiers and troops. He was preoccupied. He wasn't going to bother with a monk from Germany. But more people were able to hear the gospel. Think about, it's not a coincidence that the printing press just happened to be invented around that time. It said more and more people could see what Luther was writing and have their own Bibles and read them. But what about today? What is God doing today in our own world? Putting, after an election, putting different candidates in different places, and we look at them and we we don't understand why he would have put that person there. But we know our king is in control. We don't know why our king would allow this pandemic to continue on. But we know our king is not only in control, but for some reason, he knows that this is going to put more people in contact with the gospel. So instead of frustration when things happen in our world or when things happen in our life, a Christian is incredibly optimistic. We really are. Because we know what our king is doing in good times and in bad. In a kingdom in power, he's moving things around in this world so that he can draw more people into his kingdom of grace, so he can rule in our hearts, so that eventually he can rule forever his kingdom of glory in heaven. 
And today, and for the rest of our lives, we get a front row seat to all that Christ is doing. And when things happen in our world or in our lives, good or bad, we get to think to ourselves, I wonder how God is going to use this to save more souls. Christ is not a typical king, but he's exactly the kind of king that we needed. Amen. And may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated for our offering. Please stand for a prayer. And note it is a responsive prayer. We pray. Everlasting protector and defender, at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918, the guns of World War I went silent. To celebrate this armistice, a holiday was made of this date. But the world soon learned that the war to end all wars did not. A series of wars followed with increased efficiency and killing. Thus the holiday was changed to honor everyone who has served in our nation's armed forces. We now call it Veterans Day. But the presence of our veterans reminds us of your warning that wars and rumors of wars will continue until the end of time. Lord of the nations, we ask that you continue to bless our country with men and women who are willing to go to distant and dangerous places to protect us from those who would do us harm. We pray that you will continue to bless us with soldiers to defend and protect our great land. Lord of the nations, we ask that you continue to bless our Be with our veterans and all of us as we continue our march through life. Protect us from the ambush of sin and the attacks of Satan. Give us the health and strength we need to carry out the assignments in life that you have laid before us. Lord, be our shield and strength, our guide and our defender. Give us peace and surpass us all understanding as we place our trust in Jesus. Dear Jesus, comfort the family of Vilas Lash who fell asleep trusting in you last Sunday. While the funeral services are still pending, Comfort the family with your promises of life and salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This time of grace on earth is filled with rich blessings. As we recount the blessings that Vilas enjoyed, keep our eyes also looking forward to the blessings that await us in heaven for Jesus' sake. Comfort all who mourn with the confidence of everlasting life won for us through Jesus' victory on Easter morning. And Lord, we give you thanks for leading Mrs. Penny Adix to accept the call to teach the first and second grade children in our Christian day school. May her work bring her great joy and her teaching be a rich blessing to the children entrusted to her care. Watch over Mrs. Adix as she serves you among us. Let us remember to continue to keep all our teachers in our daily prayers and show them the respect worthy of their calling as servants of the Lord. And dear Jesus, the one you love is sick. We ask you to send your holy angels to watch over Vicki Chapisky as she goes through the strenuous work of rehabilitation following her stroke. Give her patience as her body heals and mends and finally bring her safely back home again according to your good and gracious will. Fill her heart with thanksgiving that you have continually held her in the palm of your hand and are guiding her life along a path that will at last lead her home to heaven for your own name's sake. And when our time of grace comes to an end, allow us to stand before your throne, clothed in the righteousness that Jesus wrapped around us at baptism, and welcome us home to heaven for Jesus' sake. Grant us your blessings.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Good morning. Good morning. 
Great to be here with all of you today to be able to share God's word with you and think about how our, our Savior continues to rule as King in our lives and in our hearts. Um, I only have one announcement, and that's we will be having Bible study uh, downstairs. I'm actually going to be thinking the bulletin instead of we'll be talking about Ephesians. I won't be, um, but I will be. We're going to continue the conversation on what we talked about in our sermon today as far as the different kingdoms, uh, kingdom of power, kingdom of grace, and kingdom of glory. So if you'd like to join us, we'd love to have you there. God's blessings on your week, everyone.